my theory, if you put here, is that uh, in 2010, the sightings seem to have dried up. And 2010, I believe, was the coldest winter in many, many years. Yeah. It went down to minus 18 here. Mm. And there were brass uh, connective fittings under the ground for the water supply, mm. which cracked. And they'd been there for like 30 years. And it, so it had never been cold enough to crack the brass until yeah. then. So it's a, it a kind of a, a, a definite new dip. And from that year on, there were no more sightings that I know that I know about, other than the you know the the old domestic cat that gets mistaken for a, a big cat. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've been I've been asked about uh, a range of other sightings since, and obviously I'm interested and I look into them all um, yeah. that I'm asked about, and. You can almost always say it's a domestic cat or a mistake, or in one example, a toy that someone had yeah. used, uh, deliberately staged. I that one, yeah. But there is um, there is a breed, a crossbreed of uh, serval and domestic cat called a savannah cat, which yeah. can be black and big, a lot bigger than a domestic cat, and quite relatively dangerous. Yeah. But you know, maybe this sort of size. And there were three sightings in. I can't remember now if it was Exmoor or Bournemouth or it was somewhere and I was asked about this on the media and looked into it a bit and there are savannah cat breeders there and yeah, yeah. they you know if they let one out by mistake they're not going to say oh yeah. environmental health officer I'm really sorry I let one out they'll be just like mm -hmm. yeah. even if they're like, worth ten thousand pounds you don't you'd lose your your DWA license or you'd be very you know you get in a lot of trouble yeah. So it's safer to perhaps, perhaps, I'm not saying that these breeders did do that, I'm just saying it's a possibility. That people could that, keep hush. And, yeah. and whether they could survive through the temperatures and the sporadic food supply. But you hear these stories of the puma travelled 2,000 miles in America without being seen yeah. and was you know, released in Florida and died in Colorado or the other way around. Yeah. And nobody had seen it in a 2,000 mile trek. And you think, they are very good at hiding. But one thing then that... Um, one question that I have is that most of the people, and we get quite a lot of people commenting on uh, our YouTube and people that are emailing us, mention black animals. Yeah. I know yeah. they, they say jet black, and I know leopards yeah, can't yeah, be jet yeah, black, yeah, yeah. it's like very dark, you can't and tell you can still see the yeah, yeah. Um And I think about a maximum 20% were brown cats of yeah. the sightings. Um, so. What are your kind of thoughts on... On the on black that? thing. The black On the black, thing. yeah. Yeah, well, um, that's, there's, another, there's another couple of strands to the, the cat stories around here because um, one of the guys that we work with, the Naka man, who's very experienced in trapping, trapping farm cats yeah. um, to neuter them, which is really useful when you've got an escaped lynx. Yeah. Um, but also, he's been, he's been called in to try to track the pumas in the past. And he, one of his many stories is that he, uh, they, there, was a, there was a sighting or a kill or something and they put out a trap for a puma. And in the morning, it was ripped to bits. So it had been sprung, but burst out of in a way that a puma couldn't possibly have done, not strong enough, leopard could. And this, is, this correlates with the black leopard theory. And uh, as I think you've put in your other video, leopards are, phenomenally versatile cats adapted to all kinds of different environments. Um, there's some, I love the footage in, I think it was one of the David Attenborough things of the Indian leopards in cities. Yeah. People walking along, leopards start tiptoeing along the path next to them. Yeah. No idea it's there. They're amazing cats. I just kind of think there would be a little bit more evidence if there was a leopard or there'd have to be quite a lot of leopards. Yeah. Then there's another story of um, a, a, a animal transport going through, I think it was Cape Town with a leopard mm. and it crashed and upturned and the leopard escaped and they put out like half a dozen leopard traps around the suburb yeah. and they caught half a dozen leopards that they didn't know were there. Wow. And now, <laughs> I thought, mm, yeah. are any of them our leopard? No. Oh dear. There were a lot of leopards in this place. Yeah. Um, it's completely possible, I guess, but I tend to think that they pick up an injury, which because you know we nurse these animals, yeah. they live they live a lot longer in in captivity than they do in the wild. Cats do, 
um, because they get veterinary help. They crack a tooth that gets infected. That's what kills humans in the wild and it, ki it can kill them in the wild. And the, it's, it's quite tricky breeding them. And to, to, to breed a sustained population over several decades is, I just think it's really unlikely. And I, I kind of think three pumas released in the 70s, there were lots and lots of continuous stories and sightings. And people said they'd seen three, a mother and cubs, and everybody around here would say, yes, we've heard or we believe. Yeah. Um, but sustaining that population in lots of different sites around the country, I'd just be, I'd be very yeah. surprised. I think, I think it could be that there are individuals who are released by mistake who, who probably would die after their natural life cycle span of you know, 10, 15 years um, or sooner. Yeah. Um, and also this predisposition of people to think they've seen one and accounts for a lot of sightings. I, I thought I saw one um, a few years ago driving somewhere way away from here. I think it was in Yorkshire and I was driving in the middle of a field in the distance. I would, you know, if someone said, what was that? After one glance, I'd say 90% yeah. that was a black leopard. Mm. And, but I had a second look as I was driving. And it was an Alsatian cross with a broken tail, clearly. And the tail thing was probably that bit in your brain goes, whoosh, whoosh, long tail puma. Yeah. Whoa, be yeah. careful. You know, and it, this is how we evolved, is to stay alive by yeah. assuming the worst, For assuming sure. the most dramatic. And that's a really powerful thing. Most yeah. people don't really believe that because you sort of see down, like, you know, you, you really think that bit of fluff is a spider until mm. you've got the second look. And then you OK, fine. And you, yeah. and you forget how real it was a second ago. You think, oh, yeah. Uh, but that is how these yeah. sightings, a lot of these sightings happen. I, I don't know what your situation was with yours, but yeah, how long well, did you I'm, get? I'm, how long I'm did you totally get? in agreement with, um, with how the brain fills in the gaps. And my brother's a, uh, is a neuroscientist in Nashville. And yeah. so, and we have conversation upon conversation about this, and we go and far down rabbit holes with this. He tells yeah. me about the blind spot with your thumb. Yeah, where, yeah. yeah and all of that um, stuff. Um, and, um, and so I was, I was kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a real believer that most of the stuff I hear about, I'm like, you know, that, that can't be true. But then, you know, I, I, who am I to, to, to judge other people's when I'm sort of claiming of, of my own story? But, yeah. um, so what happened with my, my one, the first thing, I was driving home at night, um, and it was kind of down windy country roads, I think about 30. Um, something just ran out from this hedge and, and ran in front of me and was in front of my car. And... Um, I th my, my first thought was that I was, I was like, this is a dog because, yeah. you know, um, and initial reaction was like, oh, I even remember reaching kind of for the, um, for the door because I was going to get out and there were a couple of houses around. Um, but then I was behind it and it was kind of keeping up with me for a second and I'd sort of slowed down a bit at this point. Um, and then it darted off to the side and it sort of jumped in through this hedge, but because there was a fence behind this hedge, um, and I think it was trying to get out of my headlights. I got this really good look at, at this sort of back end, and it was a, this, you know, really long sweeping tail. And then in front of it was a rabbit, and that rabbit was... And then I was behind that rabbit for, a, for another four or five seconds, and so the whole, the whole thing lasted about 10 or 11 seconds of just, like, utter kind of shock. Um, really scary, really scary. Where um, was this then? It was in Dorset. How big was it? It was... Well, it was... Out, it was Alsatian kind of size or bigger, right? You know, it was it, it was it was pretty hefty. Um, and just the way it came out of the hedge, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It was re real sort so of graceful, compared yeah, to a dog. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, and it was pretty sobering, and it was not something I wanted to see at that point. Yeah. Uh, did you want? So, sorry, I was go. just going to say about the road thing. It reminds me of um, another. I would I would call a very strong, um, more or less confirmed sighting around here was. Um, the vet that used to work here was a very old school, old guy um, who, uh, he, he didn't suffer fools, he didn't explain, you know, and, and uh, one day after several years, he confided that he'd seen a puma um, on the A38 jumping from some roadkill at four in the morning and yeah. he said, he was driving along, no other cars, no other traffic. It was a dead animal in the thing. And this, he said this cat jumped the two lanes in one bound yeah. and made it off. And he said, no dog could make that jump. Yeah. And he clearly, as a vet, saw it in the air with its tail and off it went. And he said, 
I haven't told anybody because they just assume I was part of the loony brigade. And I said, I saw one, David, I saw one in the, in the village. And he looked at me like I was part of the loony brigade, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. Only he could have the sighting. <laughs> but it was a really good, I mean, he, he, you know, he had his failings in other ways, but he was a credible uh, observer of yeah. animals. And he, he clearly measured that objectively, that two lane distance yeah. for a jump is just not yeah. possible for a dog. It had several trees growing through and no enrichment in it. And yeah. it was actually on a, um, a captive animals uh, website of how not to keep big cats. There were, up, oh, there were really? six puma in here at one point. Yeah. Absolutely wrong. But six, yeah. this is where the males used to come because Dartmoor is on the other side of that fence. Yeah. And um, they used to come in and crawl around come around here to see the girls. Have you ever thought about putting any uh, camera traps out? We didn't have camera traps in those days. Uh, mm. We didn't have anything. Uh, now, I, I just don't think that they I just don't think they're there. But yeah. we, we do have camera traps in other places, but usually to, to track the, uh, the, the behavior of the animals in the enclosures at night. So I've been look, trying to look into this, uh, the, the reintroduction, but I can't seem to find much on it at all past February, March, I think when Michael Gove basically said no. I don't know much about it, so I haven't really formulated an opinion of whether it's a good or bad thing. I've kind of read arguments from both sides. For lines. links, yeah. Here. Yeah, well, I, obviously the Lynx UK Trust um, yeah. got in touch with me on the day that our Lynx was recaptured and said, how was it for you? <laughs> and it's like, really bad. But um, uh, the, the idea for those guys is to have an area of either Northumberland or Scotland yeah. where there are no sheep, because this is yeah. way too agricultural. Yeah. yeah. And if they, are, sure. if they see sheep, they will eat them. I mean, in Switzerland, where I spoke to a lot of scientists, there are lots of sheep um, out there, and mm. I think it's something like 0.25% of their diet is, is actual livestock. Because sheep come with people and dogs and they're not interested, they're, t they're only little animals and they don't want any trouble and they can really, they're completely adapted to catching roe deer yeah. and, and rabbits and all sorts. Yeah. And our guy caught rabbits. Um, I mean, he was lucky he escaped in uh, June or July, I think it was. Yeah. And there was a plethora of little baby rabbits bumbling around, learning how to walk, not expecting a lynx. Yeah. And, um, so his poo that we, we've managed to track a lot of his poo mm. over the over the over the month contained a lot of rabbit uh, right, fur yeah. and bits and pieces and then when he discovered a killed uh, a dog killed sheep because we could tell that they kill messily yeah yeah like yeah, a, yeah the they, head was all chewed not, yeah um, he'd uh, he discovered that he could eat it from the anus which is a soft entry point down the thigh yeah and then that was it he couldn't you know how now he doesn't his mother had never shown him how to pull yeah. the fur off and so we just thought well that white fluffy thing was tasty there's one yeah. had another and his kills were just like that Straight clinical the punch wind, yep. again he ate from the anus down ran out got another one and yeah. he, he got he got three in the first night uh, that he wow. discovered sheep yeah. Yeah. and luckily that meant that we knew where he would be the next night he's coming back to that spot yeah. so we cleared them away yeah. and all the live sheep put in some heavily baited traps so when he came yeah. for his seconds he made the fatal mistake of tiptoeing into one of the traps and we got him back but sure. so close so lucky mm -hmm.